Hello everyone, this is Necrostevo and you're watching part 3 of my video series in learning to predict in Pokemon. Now in the last video, we covered the early game and kind of choosing your lead Pokemon. Now this video is going to be centered upon covering the mid to late game and also just things you can learn from a win or a loss in the battle video. Be sure to click like if you like this tutorial and also feel free to leave your own tips for mid to late games and things you should learn or can learn from battles. Now, in the mid game, a lot of things have normally been established by this point. If you viewed the other tutorial, you will notice that by this point you've garnered a lot of information about your opponent's team. You've probably picked up on tells about their play style, and you also probably figured out what their win conditions are for the battle. Not only is this important for the mid to late game, but this is also important information for just understanding how your opponent is going to approach the mid to late game. Specifically looking at the number of Pokemon your opponent have left, if you have significantly more Pokemon than your opponent has left, you can probably afford to play a little bit more risky. But if you both have a similar amount remaining, or your opponent has the advantage such as entry hazards on the field, well it's important to take those into account as well. Now, in the mid game, there is still probably 10 turns remaining in the battle. Uh, normally in a mid game scenario, neither side has a very clear shot at victory, but it is apparent what parts on each person's team are their weaker links. Now, in the mid game, held items become extremely important because most teams are built with the idea of an item clause or no two items can be used throughout. You can only have one of each item on each Pokemon throughout the battle. Most teams are built with that in mind. Um, if you're in a tournament scenario, definitely have those rules in mind. If there isn't an item clause, especially in a tournament scenario, people are much more likely to abuse uh, more common items such as Choice Scarf, Life, Dor Life Orb, and Leftovers. However, if the item clause is in effect, you should be narrowing down which items your opponent is using. Some items are really easy to tell if your opponent is holding those items or not. Things such as Life Orb and Leftovers and Black Sludge give a prompt after they are used to let you know that the item is in effect. Life Orb will take HP away from your opponent and say that, that, that the opponent or your Pokemon lost HP. And Leftovers, of course, it'll say the Pokemon ate some of their Leftovers and they get one uh, a little bit of percentage of their HP back. Now, other items which are very prevalent, such as Choice Band, Choice Scarf, Choice Specs, Assault Vest, Rocky Helmet, um, and to a lesser extent, other items such as Red Card, all those basically require either you to physically attack your opponent and touch them most of the time, or for your opponent to attack you. Now, it's important, especially for items such as Choice Scarf, to keep those items in mind. Uh, as I mentioned in the other videos, if you're able to kind of narrow down which Pokemon is more likely to have a Choice Scarf, for example, if your opponent has a Noivern and a Rhyperior, it is less likely, even if only slightly less likely, that the Rhyperior, the really, really slow Pokemon, is holding a Choice Scarf just because the Choice Scarf won't really help that much. Meanwhile, a Noivern, a really, really fast Pokemon holding a Choice Scarf, can utilize it more because then it can outrun other Choice Scarf Pokemon. So just having those types of things in mind can really, really help out. Now, uh, when your opponent attacks you or when you attack your opponent, that's where experience really comes into play. Uh, having a general idea of how much damage an attack should do to one of your Pokemon, barring a critical hit, of course, will help you tell if your opponent has a choice band, a choice Bex, or if they have a Life Orb and it has, you know, for example, a Pokemon that has the ability Sheer Force, there will be a Life Orb recoil. Likewise, um, having an idea of the speed of your opponents and your own Pokemon, then whether or not that's exactly knowing the number for base speed is, is useless. It's just knowing whether or not who's faster. Uh, for example, in 5th gen, uh, Hydreigon was one base speed point slower than um, Haxorus. Haxorus had 98 base speed and Hydreigon had 97 base speed. Most of the time, one base speed point isn't going to matter, but in the scenario where Hydreigon with max speed is up against Haxorus with max speed, and there is no other item in play and no sticky web and nothing like that to interfere with the speed, Hydreigon will always be outsped 
by Haxorus. And that's only one point. So just having an idea in the mid game of the items that you're dealing with will help you really, really keep a leg up on your opponent. Um, and if you notice that your opponent is doing other things, for example, choice items, of course, force your opponent to use one move until they switch out and switch back in. So, for example, if you see your opponent use a fire type move and you bring in a rock type, and every single time they do that, they have to they they switch out. Well, maybe it's time to try predicting them to switch out if they if they use that fire move and they're locked into it. Because if they're locked into it, they're not going to stay in in an unfavorable scenario. So just paying attention to your opponent's play style and and not being predictable, but just understanding what the limits of their team are can really help you in the mid game. It can help you start to tip that balance in favor of yourself. Now, a few other things that can help you are going to be abilities such as Frisk, which will outright tell you what item your opponent has, um, and also the ability Trick. A lot of Pokemon will utilize that move to switch items with the opponent, and not only does that tell you exactly what item they have, because you just gave them that item, also you can see what item they were holding, which might give you information about the type of set that they were running. Uh, for example, if you use Trick and you receive a weakness policy from a Dragonite, well it's safe to assume that it's probably more of a Dragon Dance type setup sweeper. But if you receive a choice band from the Dragonite, it's very likely that it doesn't have Dragon Dance because it doesn't make sense to use Dragon Dance on a choice band set. So keeping those types of concepts in mind when you are in the middle of a battle, when you're getting close to the last 10 to 12 turns of the battle, can help you tip things in your favor. Now also what's important to keep in mind are the win conditions. Those win conditions that I spoke of in the first and the second video, not only are they important to preserve for your own team, but you're trying to get rid of those for your opponent. And as the battle goes on, those win conditions may or may not change. Uh, for example, a really um, risky prediction may or may not pay off, which opens the door to uh, a new win condition. Alternatively, a risky condition that a, a risky prediction that does not pay off can completely shut down one of your opponent's win conditions, or you may sacrifice one of your own. So, as those win conditions are changing, uh, it's just good to be aware of them. One scenario that is fairly common, especially now with how offensive teams are generally, is uh, being able to break through walls. Typically, on most teams, they're going to be one, maybe two Pokemon that are just designed to come in, take hits, recover HP, and then make it annoying for the Pokemon that they're facing enough so that that Pokemon has to switch out, and then they can bring in something else safely. Uh, examples of this are going to be Mega Venusaur, Regenerators like Amoongus or Slowbro, um, or even just Pokemon that have the ability to switch out before they're even hit by utilizing U-Turn and Volt Switch. The quicker you're able to break down those walls, the easier it will be for your win condition to come in and either set up or to start taking huge uh, amounts of HP out of your opponent's Pokemon. So if you determine that the win condition are going to be wall type Pokemon, then your way to enter that may be setting up entry hazards to punish them for switching around so much, or it may be just toxicing them. If they're staying in and trying to really trying to raise their HP up, then Toxic may be your best answer. Alternatively, sometimes walls are easy to set up on, uh, so utilizing boosting moves against walls as a way to raise the amount of damage that you can do to them, because most walls are relegated to a certain set of attacks. You generally have a restoring move, Toxic or some other status move, one offensive move, and then maybe another coverage move just based on what they're trying to hit. Uh, and granted, most Pokemon are relegated to those, but walls, since their primary focus is to stay alive and to take hits, they're going to be using weaker moves most of the time, because those moves not only have more PP to use, um, but they generally have more utility. So your boosting moves may be useful for that, and then also just entry hazards to punish those Pokemon for switching in and out so much. Now, your other win conditions are going to of course vary depending on the type of team that you notice your opponent has in the early game or maybe even on the team preview screen. If your opponent is using weather, in the mid game, by the mid game, it is very likely that you've already taken out their weather starter or it is at very low HP just from, you know, virtue of switching in and out so much 
and from taking kind of sustained residual damage over time. Now, if your opponent is playing with the Weather Team, it is very likely that they have one or two Pokemon that abuse the Weather to either raise their speed, the power of their attacks, or make them more bulky. And so, if they are going to let their Weather um, Starter be KO'd, it's likely that they're going to bring in the Pokemon that's going to abuse the Weather directly after that. So you should be prepared, if you are in a state where you can KO the Weather Abuser, or the Weather Starter rather, you should be prepared to handle the Weather Abuser. You never want to KO the weather starter when they have the maximum amount of turns of weather left and they have a damp rocks so and now it's eight turns instead of uh, the measly four or five turns and then they get to bring in something that has swift swim for all of those turns if you can stall it out or replace it with your own weather before KOing them uh, all those are going to be ways to really take advantage of the mid game in a way where you can have things in a more favorable, favorable position it's also important to note what your opponent's uh, wind conditions are because it can vary between things like the, the wall and the weather conditions or it can be a boosting sweeper. Um, there are many different types of boosting moves. The most prevalent are probably going to be Quiver Dance and Dragon Dance um, because those not only raise your offensive stats but they also raise your speed. So if you notice Pokemon on your opponent's side of the field that can make use of Quiver Dance or Dragon Dance, it's good to be aware when your opponent may have an opportunity to set those up. That way you don't KO something and inadvertently leave a window open for your opponent to come in and set up in your face. Uh, examples of that are going to be, for example, you may have out your Haxorus. Haxorus is a very, very powerful physical sweeper. This is great, but you may have a Bandit Haxorus and your opponent may know that you have a Bandit Haxorus and you lock yourself into Earthquake to KO something like a Carbink. That's great that you KO'd the Carbink, but now your opponent can bring in his Dragon Dance Dragonite, and you're forced to switch out because you're locked into Earthquake, giving your opponent a free chance to set up with Dragon Dance, and his multi steel is still intact. How do you avoid that scenario? Well, instead of locking yourself into Earthquake, either lock yourself into another move, for example against Carbink, if it's at low enough HP, a rock type move may be good enough, like Rock Slide, to KO the Carbink, and then Dragonite cannot come in for free and set up all over you. So you just have to take scenarios like that into account. It's a matter of thinking of, if I do X, what will Y be? It's just thinking about that, and sometimes you don't have all the time in the world to think about that, and in the mid game, you may still not have all the information you need to make all those uh, decisions. But what's important is that you have that mindset to start thinking about things in that way. Um, one, a uh, few other things that are going to be important as far as wind conditions go are going to be switch-ins to entry hazards. Uh, just because entry hazards are very prevalent in the current metagame and they probably always will be, it's basically one turn and then you have continual residual damage on your opponent based on when they switch in. And so some Pokemon being weak to entry hazards only can switch in four or sometimes three times depending on the amount of HP that they have. Or I guess it'd be three or five if you're hitting an odd HP number. So with your own Pokemon, be aware of how many times they can switch in. This is especially important for Pokemon that use Life Orb as well. Um, it's not as important for Pokemon that have access to Leftovers and Black Sludge because if they can survive the switch in, then they'll get a little bit of the HP back. But with those Pokemon that are weak to it, you need to know, literally down to the number, how much damage they're going to take when they switch into entry hazards. For Charizard, he's going to lose half of his HP every single time. So it's important when you're EVing him to leave him with a number that's not divisible by four so that he will be able to switch in one additional time. Uh, same thing with Pokemon that are only single weak to rock type attacks such as Noivern. Noivern is going to be switching in and out a lot of times because it's often choice spec or choice scarfed. Have an idea of how many times he can come in. And if you don't have an idea, it's as easy as going to the summary screen and looking at the math or looking at their HP and doing a quick little divided by four on their HP. And you know how much, how much HP they're going to take just from switching in. So just be aware of that so that you aren't sacrificing your win condition to entry hazards when you don't have to. Uh, and that's why it's also important to make sure you keep your 
Defogger or Rapid Spinner alive uh, throughout the battle if your opponent keeps on setting up entry hazards. You definitely want to make sure that during that mid-game period where Pokemon start to get KO'd more frequently, their entry hazard setter is gone. That way you can permanently get rid of their hazards and not have to worry about them anymore throughout the rest of the battle. Now in that late game, um, not only are all these other win conditions important, but in the late game, normally only two Pokemon are remaining. There's probably three to five turns left in the battle. We're down to the wire. And in the in the late game, it's just really important to, to assess what the win condition is and when to use it. It's one thing to have um, a win condition, but it's another thing to utilize it properly. Um, if your win condition is contingent upon one of your opponent's Pokemon being KO'd, do you have the capability to KO that Pokemon? If not, what hacks can you start playing in your favor to at least give you a chance of it? Sometimes it's not whether or not you can do enough damage, it's can I flinch my opponent? Can I burn them with Scald? Uh, can I get a boost from using this other move that has uh, a 50% chance of boosting, such as Fiery Dance? Things like that. There are other options to consider, and it's good to be aware of the secondary effects of not only your own moves but your opponent's moves because you never know when you might have to rely on a 30, 50, 10 percent chance something happen uh, with different types of moves and different effects so be aware of those secondary effects um, also in the late game even if it looks hopeless I think it's important not to give up um, Pokemon is one of those weird games where the Random number, random number generator can can be just as kind as it is horrendous and uh, as we saw actually in, in Worlds uh, the both this year and I think last year um, well I don't know exactly what happened this year but I've heard rather you always have that chance of freezing flinching those 10% chances where it's like that never happens I've played 50 matches and I've never seen ice beam freeze and then you get frozen and now you are stuck and your opponent has a chance to win now. So it's just important, maybe not as important for casual matches depending on how serious you are, but don't give up. Don't forfeit. Make your opponent earn that victory. And if, you, if you've invested all this other time in the match, why not play it out to its completion? Um, for those of you who play online with passerbys a lot, definitely don't disconnect. At the end of the day, it is just a game. The other person may be trying to save the battle for their own purposes or to post it on their channel to show, yeah, it's a really good battle with this opponent. Don't disconnect. It's just bad sportsmanship. But in that late game, uh, it's just important to not give up because you never know what's going to happen. So just keep that, that hacks happens that I said in the beginning in the first video in mind. Now say you are finished with the battle. You, you may have won. You may have lost. You may have had a tie or tiebreaker as said by different rules and different games and things like that when you're in a tournament. All that really doesn't matter as much as what you take away from the battle. Once it's a tournament, then it probably sucks if you lost. But when you lose, especially when you win, you don't necessarily learn as much because typically you're like, okay, I probably played this correctly. I won. When you lose, it's important to look at, number one, why did you lose? But number two, was it preventable? Was it a scenario, like I said earlier, where you should not have locked yourself into a, a ground type move because your opponent can bring in a flying type? Is that preventable? Or was it the type of thing where your opponent flinched you four times in a row and they just got great luck with the random number generator? Losing is something that happens to everyone. Um, I myself am on a 14 game losing streak right now as I narrate this video. Um, but it, I think that the most important thing you can take away from losing is just to look back at the battle. Oh, there are several things to take away from that. Not only can you learn things about your opponent's playstyle, there are many different types of players out there, whether it's Pokemon or chess or D&D. People have certain personalities that make them inclined to play a certain way. And the more you battle, the more you're going to start to pick up on those types of personalities. So just looking back at how your opponent played certain things and, and different Pokemon, that alone can give you an idea of what you should take away from the battle and just understanding that type of playstyle. Also, it's good to look back at the risky plays you made, 
and the safe plays you made. Which ones did you make? Should you have made different plays? Why did you make them when you made them? Those are all things to take into account because when you're looking back at a battle, you know how 2020 vision, you now know the outcome. When you're in the midst of the battle, when you have not had very many battles and you don't have as much experience, sometimes it's hard to make those decisions. But the more you battle and the more experience you obtain, it becomes easier to make risky decisions because you learn how people play and you also learn the limits of the game. So be sure to take a look back at when you made risky plays or when you made safe plays. Did you over predict and lose a Pokemon? Or did you over predict and only take a little bit of damage? Uh, did you make the safe play and your opponent completely predicted it? Or did you make the safe play and your opponent over predicted it? Things like that are just good to keep in mind because it's likely that you're going to battle people who have the same playstyle as your opponent in that battle in the future. Now, finally, one last thing to look at when you are uh, battling, at least, is how to prepare for the things that you lost against. Um, so I guess that's just how to prepare for future matches, really. Uh, and the best way that I can say to do that is just on top of that battling experience that I said from just battling a lot of people watching battles online but be aware of what's popular in the current metagame um, as I said in the first video just being aware of the threats that are out there it allows you to, to make a team that can at least handle the things that are popular so whether or not you battle a lot or you only battle once a week or you just like to watch battle videos you're going to have a better awareness of what the metagame is like if you are constantly in it, immerse yourself in it. This is Pokemon is a community as much as it is a video game. Um, you guys come in and you watch my videos. You probably watch at least two or three other YouTubers, and you probably uh, play the game on your own a lot. And you probably play the game with your Facebook or Twitter friends as well, maybe even on Skype. So, in all those are different microcosms of communities of different types of players who all kind of think about the game in different ways that when viewed on the whole there's probably only a couple you know larger types of ways to think about the game so just in preparing for future matches just looking back on the way that people have played in the past uh, being aware of how much damage you normally take from certain attacks and also being aware of speed and other strategies that are used um, to alter speed whether it be trick room or toy scarf those are going to most put you in uh, the best state to succeed in future matches. So, I hope you all have enjoyed this uh, prediction series that I wanted to do, and that is now done. I enjoyed making it, it's been a good exercise for me too, just to kind of think about how I play this game, and to share some of that knowledge with you all. And I hope you have enjoyed it, if you have, please leave a like on this video, and be sure to share it with people, and also leave in the description the type of tutorial you would like to see me do next. Um, prediction was one that I've wanted to do for a while because it just a lot of people feel really daunted by predicting and it seems really risky to do during battle. But I'm really happy to really put this information out there and I look forward to making more videos for you all to kind of describe my own thought process when I am making uh, different plays in Pokemon or even making sets. So. Uh, be sure to go check out the other parts of the video if you haven't. I will leave uh, annotations to those in this video. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Alrighty, bye bye now.